And tonight, I'm actually going to actually share with you a brand new show that we really haven't worked out how to do it. So you are all test dummies tonight. So do you mind? <laughs> but what I want to call this show, it is actually Walking in the Light. And it's coming from the reality of my journey as a Christian, uh, walking in the light. Because without light, there is no photography. Okay? And to me, walking in the light is very symbolic. Look, I love walking with Jesus. Now, I am going to be talking about Jesus tonight. Some people come and they think I'm going to do a photographic workshop or something and talk about f-stops and camera speeds and all that. Forget it, that's boring. And if you want that sort of stuff, it's in a little book like this and you can get all that and you can fill your brain up full of all that stuff. But I am going to tell you the secret of my photography. Okay, so if you're after the secret, and it is simply this. If you get to know God, the Creator, it's very easy to be creative. And I'll tell you what, if you want to be a, a really at the cutting edge and beyond that, when you tap into God, He just wants to blow your mind out of the way. Because your mind limits you to what people have done before and things like that. God is a creative God. He just, and look, I often, my clinical brain gets in the way sometimes. I see a shot, I think, oh, I've done this before. This will be a great shot. It sells well, you know. And I'm going click, click, click. But then, praise God, God gets my attention and says, look the other way, son. And I'll show you some examples of that later on. So, the key to my photography is I'm an average photographer with a great God. And that's not false humility. I'm telling you, be average with a great God and nothing is impossible. If you saw me today, this morning, you'll know my favourite scripture is, I can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens me, Philippians 4.13. And I know it's real. I, look, people say, tell me God's real. I say, are you for real yourself? I mean, hello, open your eyes. How do you think this happens? Just by chance? You know, it's very real. And that's how I actually became a Christian, looking at creation. After a while, you can't deny it. And here's Jesus. He said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness. You will have the light that leads to life. And people tend to think being a Christian is boring. Being a worldie is boring. You know, like the highlight of the worldie existence has been in Who magazine. Who cares, they should call it, because, you know, like God blows that out of the water. So, anyhow, I'm going to show you. Let's show you some photos. Now, where did my photography start? We all have a calling in life, whether you want to acknowledge it or not. We have a God purpose. And you want to know something? Very few people ever find their God purpose. You have a moment under the spotlight. God has destined something for every one of you. But you know the thing that stops us achieving that? It's fear. It's fear of letting go of this or letting go of this. This is my dad and this is my mum. He decided that he was going to go to the mission fields back in the 50s. He's one of the Missionaries up in the Kimberleys, the last one with some of the tribal people. And he went up there and then he comes back and does a speaking engagement similar to this in a church. Some beautiful lady sees him and my mum. And she decides, I'm going to go with him to the mission field. And she's a Sydney girl, you know. And she's never been in the bush. So he goes and comes back, marries her, takes her for the honeymoon to the mission field in the most remotest location you can do and this is her on the boat peeling potatoes the boat they had look at this next photo of the boat i mean we're talking about an old lugger that had wormholes in it and they had to go like 300 kilometers to this really remote location and you know it and here they are hunting for dugong because you don't go down to the supermarket you got to live off the land like everybody else and here's my mum and my dad up here and they're up there and it's a God calling on their life and they're not up there bashing them with Bibles they're up there actually trying to teach them skills yes they were Christians and they were teaching about Jesus but they were teaching by their life they were talking to them and teaching them from the Bible but my dad was teaching them how to muster cattle giving them skills so that when they would have to be integrated they'd have skills and my dad was so highly thought of up in that area and here is reconciliation in action, you know, <laughs> like, this is way back. 
You know, this is not me, but this is one of my little uh, relatives that um, was up there. Look, I didn't even know there was a difference between black and white when I was young. I was brought up with indigenous people, you know, and I just never really realised that there were any different colours, you know. I just, you know, so this is full tribal people up in the Kimberleys. Now, I'd love you to go back to the photo of my dad on the horse if you could. You know, this was a three to four year period of my dad's life. And it is the most powerful thing in his memory to this day. Now, my dad now has dementia. And you know, I'm sorry this is still hard, this area, but my dad has dementia. And the thing is, when it comes to your mind, you think your mind is so powerful. Man, your mind is dangerous and it can actually leave you. And my dad, he's got this dementia, but when I talk of the times of the Kimberleys, he always remembers those things. And you know, the only way my dad finds his room, because he's in a dementia hospital area, he sees that photo of him on the horse. And he knows that's his room. He says, that's my room. And you know the other thing, my dad, when I prayed with him, he is totally there. Now what is that? He's mine, he can't remember anything. But he can remember that. And he can remember the Kimberleys. Look, you have a destiny and it's the only thing that's really worthwhile. Don't let your life go by and drop your dream. God has shown me tonight that there's many people here who have dropped their dream. We know God's talking to you. Now look, keep going. Now these photos inspired me. I was a city boy. I was making lots of money. People told me that if you make lots of money, you're happy. Well, that's not true. You just get a lot of friends around you who don't really, you know, aren't your friends. They just love your money. So, and you're not sure who's who. You know, if you don't have any money, you're very blessed in a way because you know exactly who your friends are. And it, also, and it certainly cuts down on your Christmas shopping list, I'm telling you. So, my dad all of a sudden I'm making all this money and you know, I just thought this is not working for me. I wasn't a Christian. I thought there's got to be more to life than this. Happy sad, happy sad. So dad all of a sudden said, son, I'm going up to the Kimberleys. We're going to find these painting sites, a painting site that was for Sir George Gray. And, and you know, like God has a sense of humour. Often he will get you on a journey and you think you're in control, but he excites you with something and you think, wow, that's a good idea. So I'm off to find these sacred caves, you know. And while I was up there, the guy who was going to show us, he was this Christian guy who'd done all this anthropological work up in the Kimberleys with the indigenous people. He actually translated the Bible into their language. So he knew his Bible really well. He knew the Greek and he knew also the Hebrew. And man, I try and argue with him about Christianity. And I'm telling you, you don't pick on a Bible translator if you're going to have an argument about the Bible. He'd just say, let's see what the Bible says, shall we? And I thought, oh no, here we go. And off we go and he could recite it without even having a Bible with him. So we're there and it was, he was inputting into my life. And you know, God is very funny, but I thought I'm there to get a cave. Now, we didn't find the cave. We actually, this guy and I really bonded. He was one of the people who really impressed me about Christianity because he was a real Christian. And you know, I've got to tell you, sometimes on your journey, they're hard to find. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of flakes and fakes. And sometimes there's a lot of lemon juice Christians that look like they've been baptised in lemon juice. But <laughs> there's some fantastic ones too, praise God. And there's a really, really, really high percentage in this church. So that's great. We're in a good church. But on with the story. So I'm looking at this painting, but I see this one. Now, the one that we're looking for, uh, what happened, we didn't find at that time. But then let's go. We finally did locate the painting later on. Now look at this painting. This is the one that I was going looking for. That's nowhere near as impressive as the other one, is it? You know, like, so we, we thought this is where it was, but Howard, my friend, he went there and he knew, like, uh, he sort of left this bottle there with a message in it. And only a couple of years ago, we knew the location because he left me all the details of where it was. So we flew in with a helicopter. That's a lot better than walking, I tell you. But it took us three weeks before. But anyhow, we flew with a helicopter and we landed and then I saw the bottle and I opened it up and pulled out the note and there was a note from Howard saying, I knew you'd make it, Ken. It was exactly where we thought it was, you know. And man, that just brought me unstuck because that man was part of my reason because of how I became a Christian.
And you know, for him to leave that note for me was so an amazing thing. And yet that man has influenced so many lives. Now, life is a journey. It's an adventure. You know, you've got to let go of your anchors. <laughs> you can't be dragging an anchor around. It's great to have an anchor in the throne room of God, but you can't be dragging an anchor around. You've got to be able to go. And one thing I found out about God, he wants to say, come on, let's go on an adventure. You know, it's like when you first started traveling when you're younger, you just get on a plane. I got on the plane and ended up in New York. I went from the Kimberleys after this Kimberleys trip to New York. I just thought it seemed like a good idea at the time. You've got to have that adventure, spirit of adventure. That's what God's wanting to do in our lives, you know. And I love this because it's like that sailing away. You know, that's where the adventure of life becomes, you know. So let's go on. We'll keep going. See, God wants to walk and talk with us. He, he really, he loves us so much that he sent his son. You all know the story. If you don't, where have you been for the last 2,000 years, you know? We all know the story. But Jesus, lo Jesus loves us so much that he gave his life. And God loves us so much he gave his son so that we can be reconnected to God. He wants to walk and talk. It started in the Garden of Eden. But what separated man from God was sin. And what is sin? Self-indulgent nature. Look at me, you know, like the eye will, the iPhone, the iPod, nothing wrong with those things. But man, they get a bit obsessive. It's the eye life, you know. But this is not Photoshop. This is God light. Okay, I'm sick of it. Oh, it's Photoshop. Look. <laughs> it's shot on film. I can actually show it. God is better than Photoshop. I'm telling you, you wait. Now look. He keeps me waiting for ages sometimes, and I know why. Because he wants to spend more time with me. He wants to spend more time with you. I could take photos a lot quicker if I just did more prayer when I was back at home. But no, he keeps me waiting sometimes for days for photos. So what else have I got to do? There's no iPods and iPhones out there. There's only talking to Jesus. So I'll spend days talking to Jesus, and it gets very exciting. He talks back to you and stuff. Now this is, I'm trying to tell you stuff here about how God works. Look, people say, oh, is God real? Look, that is a stupid question. Of course God's real. How do you think this planet got here? Just by chance, a cosmic explosion? Well, who created the explosion? Come on. Anyhow, I come down here, but I'm in control. I'm going to take a photo. Now, I'm not actually at this area, and when you see this photo, it's like an angel. A big angel. This thing here is like a big angel. Oh, sorry about that. There's no one there, praise God. That's like a, a big angel, and there's three little angels looking up at the big angel when you see the print. Anyhow, so what happens is I'm shooting this shot, not that angle. I've got another angle, because I know what I'm doing. I've done it before. So I'm sitting there, and I've got the shot of the century. I'm just going to do it. Then all of a sudden, this Buddhist lady comes down, dressed in orange, and she comes down and sits in my photograph. Like, now, I go, hello, God. Like, come on. She was here after me. She is in my photograph, God. You need to get rid of her. And then she's like, totally oblivious to me. She's like, um, um. Like, she's doing the oneness with the universe thing where I'm going, Lord, get her, get her, you know? Because I'm, I'm making little smart aleck comments saying, ah, oh, right, how are we going? One with the universe, are we? Really good. And she's not even hearing me, she's zoned out. I, look, I'm naughty sometimes, okay? I don't know. God's good though, he puts up with me. So, anyhow, all of a sudden God said, uh, I'm trying to convince God to move her, and God said, son, just move. But I was here first, you know? Okay, I'm moving. Okay, I get it. So I move. And then as soon as I moved, I just set up my camera, and all of a sudden, boom, click. Look, God has to move you sometimes. Here's another example. Come on to the next one. I think it's the, oh no, have you got the one of the waterfall with the boat? Well, we, we haven't got that one here, have we? No, well, this is another one anyhow. This is down in Tasmania. I was down there, and I saw this tree. Now, I photographed that tree, and he showed it to me, and I got in there. And now that tree's gone. Everybody goes to look for that fern tree. Being there for 150 years, I photographed it, and then, it, and then it's gone. You know? So it's just, I do not have a chainsaw in my camera. So, 
<laughs> no, but it's just like, okay, God, what are we doing here? And everybody goes looking for that tree. I say, no, 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 God showed me first. Okay. <laughs> On the next one, because often that's my job. I go and find places and people go and put. Now again, this is not Photoshop. These are all on film. And look, I often, God has us on a journey. You've got to realise that God often just uses a, a destination as a momentum. Okay, he gives you an idea. I want you to go here. But you've got to watch out because along the journey, that could be the real thing. Look, God has just got to get our butts into gear because we are basically comfort-driven people that want to get comfortable and slip onto the lounge and watch AFL. No, or watch anything. <laughs> um, AFL's okay. But what you've got to realise is that it's momentum like a ship. So God's got to get the momentum happening and you've got to help him. You know, you can't be kicking you all the way. You've got to start getting some momentum, aiming for something, but be ready for God to guide you because God is like the rudder. And you know, if the ship is not moving anywhere, a rudder is useless. And a lot of Christians need to let go of the anchor that they've got around them and let get going for God's rudder to start working. Because I just about drove past this photograph, okay? This is up in Victorian high country, and I'm driving past and I just felt God say, stop. And I go, just a bunch of trees, God, come on. You know, okay, okay, I'm stopping, I'm stopping. So I stopped and I took this photo. Now those trees are no longer there. Those last set of fires. <laughs> it's really bad, isn't it? Can I photograph your house, please? <laughs> no, look. They're gone, those last fires. I've been past their they're dead sticks. They're like black as anything, you know? I've never thought of this before. I'm going to be careful when I photograph. No. <laughs> But you see how good God is. You know, like that shot is one of my most so-called famous shots now. And I just think, people say, oh, you're a great photographer. Man, I've got to tell you, it was so close to not even stopping to get that shot. So I'm not great. Thank goodness God stopped me. And here again, look, this one's horses. Now look, I'm sitting on top of a post doing the crane. Not really. <laughs> but I'm standing on top of the post with my little camera and thinking, okay, horses coming through. And I'm going, click, click. But when you've got hundreds of horses coming at you, the power of that thing, I'm going click, click, no, off the post into the creek. But praise God, the camera stayed dry. I was able to throw that out and I got the shot, you know, so, and I got wet at the same time. But <laughs> had a swim. Should have taken a bar of soap, done the bar. On to the next one. Now, look, this is an example. I'm taking a photograph of the Remarkables, okay? They're this way. And I'm doing it and I'm having a ball. I'm going, oh, this is going to be a great shot. Nearly every man his dog shot that angle, you know? So I'm, I'm shooting it in panorama and I'm shooting, shooting, shooting. And God all of a sudden says, son, turn around. You're facing the wrong way. <laughs> God, this is fantastic. And I said, okay, okay, God, I'll do a few for you. Turn around, click, click. Right, we're done with that. Right, good. Right, back to my shot. <laughs> this is the one. Click, click. I get back, I've got 50 average shots. They're mine. And I got two good ones, and they're gods. <laughs> so, look at this! Are you serious? The Victorian Museum should be buying this thing. This is a sculpture. I've seen sculptures in museums, like a rock hanging from a bit of uh, chain on a stick like this, and they creatively called it Hanging Rock, and they paid $40,000 for a stinking rock hanging off a bit of metal or something. Look at this! God's just doing this for fun. Like, look at the curve in that. Look at the positioning of this rock. Man, I wish I could get that in my garden. I, and that's still there, by the way. It hasn't been. <laughs> so, so it's safe. On the next one. And although this house is not there, actually. <laughs> what is going on? My goodness. But I look, this is on the Hume Highway. If you've driven the Hume Highway, you probably saw this a long time ago. I was coming to Melbourne. I was meant to be doing something down here meeting somebody, and all of a sudden I saw this house on the way down I thought, my goodness, that could be a great shot in the morning. And I thought, I'm going to stop. You've got to be ready to stop. Don't just be so fixated with a destination that you miss why you're really meant to be there. So I stopped, and I went in and saw the farmer. I said, look, would you mind if I camped in your shooting shed or something for the night, because I'd like to photograph the old house on the hill. And he said, sure. He said, yeah, go down there. And he said, oh, come up for dinner. So they invite me up for dinner, and no, he's like the country squire with his wife, and 
they're pulling out this roast dinner and like a little bit of red wine and pulling out the whole stuff. So I think, this is great. If you do what God tells you to do, we're having this feast. And then the next morning, I get up after a few red wines and I'm here and shooting this shot. Now, <laughs> that building's no longer there anymore. But the thing is, you know, this is what it is. Like, if you don't be prepared to stop sometimes when God's getting your attention and people say, What's your secret to photography? I try and tell them it's God. They just hate that because they want technicality. They want S-stops and all that sort of stuff. But it's real. He's, it's so exciting when you're walking with God. I don't know how people get through life without God. It's so boring. On to the next one because you're just doing stuff everybody else has done. Look at this. How, how many people have been on the beach of the Twelve Apostles? Ah, see, God got me there. You should see it. Only God could do that. You try dealing with the government. But he got me there to that location. I spent two weeks there getting this shot. And you know, the full moon, just as that, just before that, the little fairy penguins walk across my feet. You know, they're like, doo -doo -doo. you'd see one come up and he'd go to his friends, come on, come on. And all the tribe would go, oh, they're nice and they're like, oh, this is so cute. Oh, I'm to take photos. Oh, this is. <laughs> and you can see all their footprints. Look, oh, God is so good. And I'm having a great, I had two week prayer time just to get that shot, but it was great, you know. So, but sometimes when they get older, their heads get stuck and they just say, baby, this is the way I want the sun. I'm going to get in the morning, I'm not going to turn. This is the way I want it. This is the way I want my Christianity. I want it deserve to serve to me this way and that's the way I want it. Look, stay supple because you'll get twice as much sunlight, you know. And these guys are about to go to sea, so, you know, come on, you know, don't get too stiff neck. But I just love it. You know? <laughs> to me, that's just joy. It's God's joy. God loves you. Look, God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And I love being a foolish thing, you know? <laughs> because it just really messes with the little head people, you know? The little head people, they get all caught up. Now, I can do the head thing, but it's really boring. Because you're limited to man's knowledge. Why not tap into God and be unlimited? On to the next one. Here, Tears for a Nation. This shot is about reconciliation. This is a gift from God. Uh, if I told you a story, I'd be here all night. If you want to know more of the stories, they're in this book. And then this one's also The Walking in the Light. And it's actually got the technical stuff in it too for those guys who do that head stuff. They've got that too. But the thing about this, I was out there. They said, why are you coming? Because I have to, because I'm professional, right? I'm coming for a reason. I said, I'm coming to shoot Uluru with rain. <laughs> they said, you don't want to rain on Uluru. It's like if it ever happens, although lately there's been a lot. But they say it very rarely happens, and it definitely won't happen when you're coming. And so I get there, and there's no weather pattern suggesting rain will come. The next day, guess what? Rain. And the guys are saying, I can't believe this. I just can't believe this. So, well, you know, God's good. You know? And to me, this is how God feels about division in our nation. He's crying. We need to do something about reconciliation in this nation. Christians have the answers. Because, you know, reconciliation is about two roads going in different directions. It's about a cross. That's how a crossroad is as far away as you can get from any road. But where they meet, it's called the crossroad. And reconciliation, I know, is going to happen at the foot of the cross. 65% of the indigenous people in this nation at the last census put down their faith as Christians. 10% Indigenous belief. So, hello, why are we trying to regurgitate Indigenous beliefs? There's a strong Christian community out there, and I just know that us as Christians, we need to get plugged in and find out where we can help walk a while with our Indigenous brothers. There's a huge need out there, huge need, and it's not the government's job. The government just really does not have a clue what they're doing. You know, the money does not get to the people that need the help. We hold the key. Look, the key to a lot of the problems in this world are Jesus. If you start getting overwhelmed by these problems like global warming, like, hello, the only reason the planet's warming up is we're moving closer to hell. <laughs> we need to get more focused on God and start, you know, because all these money, people are driven by money, money, and all this stuff. Look, everything comes back as we focus on God, as we begin to walk about God, and we begin to realize we have a destiny, and we have a purpose for this planet and for this nation, things are going to happen. On with the show, here we go. Now, God's really good. 
Here we are at uh, Kakadu, Jim Jim Falls. Isn't it, isn't it a great swimming hole? Doesn't look great. Anyhow, I was camping in an area I possibly shouldn't have been camping in because at the real camping site it had a sign saying do not swim in the pool because there's a rogue crocodile in there. I didn't see that sign, so I'm sitting there swimming and having a ball thinking, man, what's wrong with all these tourists? They're not even coming in for a swim. And they're walking past me going, looking at me sort of straight saying, what is wrong with you? Are you English or something? You don't like what? And I'm thinking, What's wrong with these people? They should be there swimming. It's beautiful, beautiful. And my friend's there, an artist, a painter, and he's painting away, and we're just sitting there. And then I find out when I leave the park, I see the ranger said, Oh, how'd it go down there? I said, Oh, it's just a beautiful place to swim, isn't it? He said, You didn't swim, did you? I said, Oh, yeah, I'll swim. He said, There's a rogue crocodile in there. I said, Well, what, what, what are you telling me? He said, There's a sign. Oh, man, I didn't see the sign. I said, God is good. He looks after fools sometimes. Not that I recommend it. Not that I when you do that. Now this is one of my favourite scriptures. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Do you realise that my hope, your hope, if you want it, is anchored in the throne room of God? How more secure in life can you get? I have got an anchor in the throne room of God. So, man, I can hang on to that rope and I can have an adventure of a lifetime. I can swing everywhere, I can do all sorts of stuff because I know I've got an anchor that will not let me go. If you have an anchor on earth, the thing could sink. Or if I photograph it, it could disappear. No. <laughs> Look, I love that verse because you need to know where your strength is. My strength is knowing God will not let me down. Whatever your dream is that he's given you, you can do it. You can do it. Pick it up again. Pick it up again. On to the next one. This one, Uluru. Next one. Uh, you know, these are all... Took me three days to get that shot, but we got it. Praise God. And then this one's very special because my dad was there for this shot. I'm on top of the car. My dad's there. And he's downloading all this stuff. He's telling me all his history. And I'm thinking, what's he on about? I'm getting the whole family history. And I didn't realise at the time that he knew he had dementia and he was losing it and he wanted to download. So I listened, I listened, I listened. I got three days worth of history of my family and not anything like that, at least three times. And <laughs> it sank in. But I remember that time with Dad and where he did the download to his son, saying, son, you know, I need to download now this stuff with you. And... Um, when he looks at that photo, he's taken back to that time, and I am, you know, so I have that photo getting done for his room as well. So, you know, God is so good because he gave me that time to get the download of my history, even though I didn't know what was going on. On to the next one. It's called Golden Days. Now, this is Mel. Look, we were so excited when he did the Passion, right? But we've been praying for him. You know, he's been going through hell, and, you know, no one knows the story. And you know, God is gracious. We need to be as Christians. Don't, by the way you measure other people, you'll be measured. Personally, I need as much grace as I can get. So I love being gracious to other people, okay? Don't be some religious fruitcake. This guy, I believe, is going to do another movie. I'm praying for that man that he'll do the sequel. And I want you to pray for him. Pray that he can come out of that cave of condemnation, that he can come out and he can do that movie. He is a beautiful man. And God used him mightily in the Passion. Now look, when we're on the Passion, I just want to share this story. Because if people say, is the spiritual realm real? Of course it's real. Aboriginals, if you said the spiritual realm wasn't real, they wouldn't laugh at you because they're respectful. But inside they go, can you believe that guy? He doesn't believe the spiritual realm. What is wrong with him? He's been brought up in university, that's his problem. No. <laughs> And the next thing is now, so what I'm talking about is the Holy Spirit. As a Christian, when we're reconnected to God, He empowers us with the power of the Holy Spirit. And I love that exciting thing, you know. The Holy Spirit's here tonight. He's touching hearts. He's starting to do things and wake up things. So Mel's doing this movie. And what happened in this one moment, and I'll tell this story because it is funny, you've got three Jesuses. You can see one there on the ground. And then you've got another one in the background, and there's another one you can't quite see. But they're doing this big scene, a very big setup scene. They got hundreds of people. And what happened is every time they'd shoot it, someone would do something really dumb. 
Like, one guy had a watch on and you're going through the sea and you see the guy all of a sudden just behind Jesus looking at his watch. You see what time it is. And the guy goes, they didn't have watches in the time of Jesus. Well, they had sundials, but they didn't look like that, you know. And so, then the next the scene, all of a sudden another guy goes, hello, man. There's the camera's on and he's just gone like apo about this thing. And then they're going, ah. Oh. And then the third time, all of a sudden, as Jesus is going past, it's looking fantastic, and all of a sudden this guy's going, mm. right. And Mel lost it. Look, we all lose it from time to time. Every all of us. And he did something, he used the word God and Jesus in the one sentence, and he said, can't you guys get it together? And he realized he blasphemed. Now, if you're going to blaspheme, it's not a definitely good idea to do it when you've got three Jesus around you. <laughs> with lots of crosses. He felt really guilty. He just went, oh my gosh. And he just left the set. And he went back to his room and the hotel. And I thought, I've got to go back because I just thought, oh, Mel, you dodo. That was really, this is, uh, anyhow. I went back and they're trying to justify it. Our second year you should have done this. Blah, 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 and all trying to justify it. And I said, look, Mel, the reality is, you know, um, you're, you're a jerk. You just, <laughs> you sort of, thought you're in control of this movie. If you get angry, the reason you're angry is because you're not getting things the way you want. And the thing is, maybe God wants it another way. What you've got to realise is things aren't going to work. Maybe God's got another thing. You know, maybe this scene's a waste of time. Maybe he's trying to save you a lot of money. You know, he's saying, I said, look, if you get angry, all you've got to do is say, okay, God, I'm sorry, back to you. I said, look, this is a Holy Spirit movie. I said, you are really talented. You don't actually know what you're doing on movies. I'm a landscape photographer on a moving picture. And everyone's moving very quickly. And I'm going, no, oh, no, no. You know, no time to like, you think you've got problems. I'm saying, God, if you don't turn up, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, so this is what's the reality. We're on a Holy Spirit adventure if we're willing to let go. And he did. On the show, we'll quickly get through. That's Monica Blue. She had a great chance to witness with her. It was a great movie to be on. And this is, I'll finish on this one. Like I was with Paul Hagen and Shane, a good Melbourne boy. Great, great guys. And you know, God is doing something in both of their lives, I believe. And, and Paul Hagen, funny guy. And um, we sort of know him pretty well. And he's told me some jokes. He said, you know, Ken, you know, I'm, I'm into some of this Christian stuff. He said, I've got a joke about it. Actually, he said, um, you know, Jesus and God, they're up in heaven. And, and God says to Jesus, that Jesus, he said, son, look, we've got some problems on earth. Those humans are out of control, man. They're just doing lots of sinning and stuff like that. And say, so, son, I'm going to have to send you down there. The only way we're going to sort of get off the hook is you're going to have to die for them. And, um, you know, the only good news is you've got a choice how you can do it. He says, you can either... You know, we're going to do the crucifixion, which is pretty intense, but all we could, uh, you could die by an attack from killer, killer stinging bees. And Jesus went, stinging bees. Uh, well, look, I think I'll take the crucifixion. That's uh, a little bit better. So, so today, we always remember what Christ did for us to reconcile us to God through the sign of the cross. However, we do that with the sign of the cross. Whereas it could have been. <laughs> He says, look, Ken, there were two nuns. They were driving along in the car, and then all of a sudden a demon just comes on the front of the bonnet. And the other one says to the other one, quick, get out and shine your cross. And so the other one winds down the window and goes, get off the car! So, 